the garden party. And after all, the weather was ideal. They could not have had a more perfect day for a garden party if they had ordered it. Windless, warm, the sky without a cloud. Only the blue was veiled with a haze of light gold, as it is sometimes in early summer. The gardener had been up since dawn, mowing the lawns and sweeping them, until the grass and the dark, flat rosettes where the daisy plants had been seemed to shine. As for the roses, you could not help feeling they understood that roses are the only flowers that impress people at garden parties, the only flowers that everybody is certain of knowing. Hundreds, yes, literally hundreds, had come out in a single night. The green bushes bowed down, as though they had been visited by archangels. Breakfast was not yet over before the men came to put up the marquee. Where do you want the marquee put, mother? Oh, my dear. Dear child, it's no use asking me. I'm determined to leave everything to you children this year. Forget I'm your mother. Treat me as an honoured guest. But Meg could not possibly go and supervise the men. She had washed her hair before breakfast and sat drinking her coffee in a green turban, with a dark wet curl stamped on each cheek. Josie, the butterfly, always came down in a silk petticoat and a kimono jacket. You'll have to go, Laura. You're the artistic one. Away Laura flew, still holding her piece of bread and butter. It's so delicious to have an excuse for eating out of doors. And besides, she loved having to arrange things. She always felt she could do it so much better than anybody else. Four men in their shirt sleeves stood grouped together on the garden path. They carried staves covered with rolls of canvas, and they had big tool bags slung on their backs. They looked impressive. Laura wished now that she was not holding that piece of bread and butter, but there was nowhere to put it, and she couldn't possibly throw it away. She blushed and tried to look severe and even a little bit short-sighted as she came up to them. Good morning, she said, copying her mother's voice. But that sounded so fearfully affected that she was ashamed and stammered like a little girl. Oh, uh, uh, have have you come? Uh, is it about the marquee? That's right, miss," said the tallest of the men, a lanky, freckled fellow. And he shifted his tool bag, knocked back his straw hat, and smiled down at her. "That's about it." His smile was so easy, so friendly, that Laura recovered. What nice eyes he had! Small, but such a dark blue. And now she looked at the others; they were smiling too. "Cheer up! We won't bite," their smile seemed to say. "How very nice workmen were!" And what a beautiful morning! She mustn't mention the morning. She must be businesslike. The marquee. Well, what about the lily lawn? Would that do? And she pointed to the lily lawn with the hand that didn't hold the bread and butter. They turned. They stared in the direction. A little fat chap thrust out his underlip, and the tall fellow frowned. I don't fancy it," said he. "Not conspicuous enough." You see, with a thing like a marquee, and he turned to Laura in his easy way. You want to put it somewhere where it'll give you a bang slap in the eye if you follow me. Laura's upbringing made her wonder for a moment whether it was quite respectful of a workman to talk to her of bangs slap in the eye, but she did quite follow him. A corner of the tennis court, she suggested. Oh, but the band's going to be in one corner. Hmm, going to have a band, are you? Said another of the workmen. He was pale. He had a haggard look as his dark eyes scanned the tennis court. What was he thinking? Only a very small band, said Laura gently. Perhaps he wouldn't mind so much if the band was quite small. But the tall fellow interrupted. Look here, Miss. That's the place. Against those trees over there. That'll do fine. Against the caracas. Then the caraca trees would be hidden. And they were so lovely, with their broad, gleaming leaves and their clusters of yellow fruit. They were like trees you imagined growing on a desert island, proud, solitary, lifting their leaves and fruits to the sun in a kind of silent splendor. Must they be hidden by a marquee? They must. Already the men had shouldered their staves and were making for the place. Only the tall fellow was left. He bent down, pinched a sprig of lavender, 
put his thumb and forefinger to his nose and snuffed up the smell. When Laura saw that gesture, she forgot all about the Caracas in her wonder at him caring for things like that, caring for the smell of lavender. How many men that she knew would have done such a thing? Oh, how extraordinarily nice workmen were, she thought. Why couldn't she have workmen for friends rather than the silly boys she danced with and who came to Sunday night supper? She would get on much better with men like these. It's all the fault, she decided, as the tall fellow drew something on the back of an envelope, something that was to be looped up or left to hang, of these absurd class distinctions. Well, for her part, she didn't feel them. Not a bit, not an atom. And now there came the chop. Chock of wooden hammers. Someone whistled. Someone sang out, Are you right there, matey? Matey. The friendliness of it. The. the. just to prove how happy she was. Just to show the tall fellow how at home she felt and how she despised stupid conventions. Laura took a big bite of her bread and butter as she stared at the little drawing. She felt just like a work girl.